So hello everyone. Um, this is Neslihan from COGIS, which is a community where students and professionals from various fields of study get around to make resources based on cognitive sciences more accessible and provide uh, students a way of communication with the various events we hold throughout the year, such as the Academy Cognition, which is a series of talks preferably given by undergrads and master's students who are relatively less recognized book cognition that provides an opportunity for professors and students to exchange ideas revolving around a book of choice for several weeks, and growing up in science, where professors share their lifelong experiences about the academic life. You can support um, us from the patreon.com, and you can also follow our accounts on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Today's event, uh, named the Cognitive Webinar, is designed to be online and held entirely in English, aiming for an international audience. We would like to provide a platform not just for science communication, but also interaction of academics from all over the world. Today, we're going to listen to Cedric Bokes, who is a professor at the Catalan Institute for Advanced Studies, a member of the University of Barcelona Institute of Complex Systems and a member of the section of general linguistics at the University of uh, Barcelona. His, he is the author of various books such as Language and Cognition, Syntactic Islands and Their Syntax. He earned his degree in theoretical linguistics. However, his current research focuses on the neurobiological foundations of the human language by integrating various disciplines uh, such as linguistics, neuroscience, genetics, and evolutionary biology. Today, we're going to listen to his talk entitled Language, Cognition, and Biology. His talk will last about 40 to 50 minutes, and then we will give a five minute break. After the short break, we will proceed with a Q&A session, which will also last about like 30 minutes. Um, before we begin, I would like to emphasize on the fact that we will like our attendees to ask their questions with their microphones and video cameras open if possible, but it's not a requirement. And you can also ask questions through the Zoom chat as well during the Q&A session. Um, all right, um, so Cedric, please take us away whenever you're ready. Thanks, Sally. Go ahead and share my screen. All right. Um, first of all, uh, thanks uh, uh, to the COGIS organizers for, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to take part in this initiative, especially when it's uh, student run. Um, thanks also for everyone uh, who is showing up from different time zones and different parts of the world. It's uh, gratifying to see uh, the interest in the work we do and the issues that I'll be discussing with you today. I'm of course sorry not to be in Istanbul. Uh, and I take this opportunity to say hi to the friends I have there, especially the people from Boajici. And I take this opportunity also to give them a bit of uh, support. I think they need it right now. I uh, will be discussing uh, general issues touching on language, cognition, and biology, as the title suggests. I have kept the issues general just because I didn't know uh, who uh, would be uh, joining us. I've uh, tried to hint at more technical issues in various slides, and I encourage people interested in those issues to ask me uh, during the question period to go into more details about things of their interest have left ample time for discussion. So please uh, make use of that time uh, to make the event uh, more fun. To start off with, uh, I thought it might be a good idea to go back to a foundational uh, passage from Descartes that lays out, I think some of the found fundamental issues uh, at the intersection of, of cognitive science, language, and biology, as you can read for yourself in this quote, Descartes uh, highlights uh, the role of language and cognition by insisting that this is uh, the one thing that seems to be particularly specific uh, to human cognition. It doesn't seem to uh, depend on intelligence. It seems to be something that uh, separates us from other species. And it doesn't depend on the use of specific 
um, vocal organs or manual gestures. It seems to be something that impacts cognitions in ways that um, we still have to figure out. But I think Descartes in, in this quote uh, introduced a series of issues that remain with us many centuries after he uh, wrote about them. And in fact, it's passages like this one that uh, sort of underlie the um, equation or near equation between being human and having language. Being human and being with language are things that are supposed to go together. And this is an intuition that many thinkers have had. And it's an intuition that I'll, I'll carry with me and with us throughout the talk but I'll try to suggest ways of understanding this equation that may not be too faithful to what Descartes um, may have had in mind. Descartes, of course, also mentioned that one of the specific ways in, in, in which language is, is special about human cognition or for human cognition is the fact that uh, regardless of our intelligence, we seem to have an ability to arrange words together, right? Uh, for the linguists among you, uh, there's a direct allusion to our syntactic abilities in there um, that to a certain extent lead to the following conclusion. If you're interested in human cognition, then I think you'd better be some sort of language scientist, some sort of linguist. Uh, that would be the uh, the inference you could draw from uh, the passage uh, that I've just shown you from, from Descartes' writing. That's certainly the conclusion that, that Noam Chomsky drew. And as he famously said, his brand of linguistics could be called Cartesian linguistics precisely because it insists on this close connection between being human and having language and being different from other species. And these are themes uh, that have been central to Chomsky's writings, but it's not just Chomsky. You can take uh, people interested in language that do not um, uh, adopt uh, Chomsky's perspective on language, but nonetheless recognize uh, the uh, fundamental role of language in cognition. So here is Mike Tomazello uh, in, in a very good book, called Becoming Human, saying somewhere, I think in the preface, nothing says human uniqueness like language. So it's not exactly saying what Chomsky would say, but it's also recognizing essentially what Descartes uh, wrote about, namely there is some interesting and important link um, between having language and being human. And in popular books uh, recently, being Harari, being The Wall, being many other um, books that, have, uh, that I could have illustrated on this slide, you find this intuition being phrased in one way or another, but it's, it's really there. And so for those of you interested in cognitive science um, and human cognition, sooner or later, you'll have to wrestle with, uh, with the nature of language, right? But you'll also have to wrestle with dangers that come with uh, this position that Descartes had and that was adopted by linguists. And I'll list three ways in which three dangers that could um, derive from this kind of position. The dangers are not completely independent. Uh, one of them is that if you insist that there is a link between human language and human cognition, and that's very different from other species. It begs a very obvious evolutionary question, how did uh, human language emerge? And many linguists have taken the position that uh, human language is unlike anything else on the planet, and that makes evolutionary studies particularly difficult. The other thing, the other danger that I think derives directly from Descartes' position is that if you insist that language is really very different from other aspects of cognition, um, different from intelligence, different from vision, different from other things, then you necessarily end up with a very modular view 
of language with respect to cognition, a, way, a view that encapsulates the study of language and sort of shields it from many considerations that would be, I think, very relevant in the context of cognitive science. And that danger leads me to the third danger, which is that if you isolate human language from other species, from other domains of cognition, then you essentially end up doing biology at what linguists like to say a suitable level of abstraction, which is no biology at all. And you also end up doing language work at a suitable level of cognition, meaning not cognitive science very much. And what you end up doing then is feeding into a tendency of paying attention to um, details about language that's more um, familiar to the philologists than to the cognitive scientists and the biologists. And I think, I think that these dangers should be kept very much in mind when thinking about the role of language cognition in the context of Descartes' uh, study. There's a, there, there are, of course, ways of, of, of avoiding these dangers or minimizing the risks of, um, you know, for example, confusing philology and cognitive science. And I think the most obvious way of doing this is, uh, for example, to follow not Descartes, but Darwin um, and see that other species, even though they might not be linguistic creatures the way we are, nonetheless have a lot to tell us about language and cognition, right? Um, in fact, I think if you are interested in human cognition, uh, it's not enough to be a language scientist. You also have to be uh, very quickly, I think, an evolutionary biologist. This sort of um, idea has uh, surfaced in recent papers in in ways that I think bear on the role of language and cognition. So I'll give you two examples that I think are very telling. So here's a very good paper by Rich, Richardson and colleague saying roughly that uh, students of animal cognition basically agree with Darwin that human cognition is continuous with animal cognition, right? So the difference is a matter of, of degree, not of kind, but nevertheless, they, uh, in the passage that I'm quoting from, they say only one widely recognized difference remains, which is the human language capacity, all right? So they say, yeah, human cognition and animal cognition continues, but the big difference is still language. So here's Descartes still writing as it were through them. Here's another very good paper on uh, human cognitive uniqueness by Kevin Leyland and Amanda Seed. Let conclude, as the quote says, that there are no traits present in humans and absent in other animals that in isolation explain what makes us human. That's great. That's very Darwinian, right? Later on in that article, they said that at least three features collectively underpin what makes us human, right? A capacity for imitation, a capacity for teaching, capacity for instruction. And then the third thing that they list is look, a symbolic language. Right. So they go through lots of different examples of cognitive traits, manage to reduce them to three. Two of them are very general, imitation and instruction. And the third one is the one thing that seems to be, um, you know, specifically human for Descartes, that's language. And I think that, so even though um, the quotes that I've just given you adopt a Darwinian perspective, you can still see a Cartesian remnant in them, specifically in the context of language, not for any other aspect of cognition. That is, I think, uh, telling. And this is this aspect that I'd like to try to, to get rid of. That is, I'd like to really advocate for a, a full Darwinian view on, on, on language. And so I'd like you to adopt a perspective where instead of seeing language as this thing that's unique, special, different from anything else and just for us. I'd like you to switch that perspective, just like this um, painting from Archimboldo, to uh, try to decompose this remarkably unique collection into units that are recognizable um, elsewhere in cognition and elsewhere in other species. So I'd like to 
um, encourage you to do that switch with me for the rest of the talk. And I'll try to, to suggest to you that there are interesting advantages for cognitive science when you do uh, that switch. But in order for that switch to take place, I think there are a couple of prerequisites that I'd like to spend a bit of time on. First thing is, um, it's very important for that switch to be successful, to insist on recognizing many linguistic antecedents in other species. It's also extremely important to give time for evolution to work its magic. And it's also very important to look for as many sources of evidence for that position as possible. And you will see exactly what I mean in a couple of slides. Let's start with antecedents, right? I think that there is a, a line of research within the language sciences uh, that uh, that's going in the right direction, where um, people try to find ways of recognizing um, linguistic abilities in species that are not traditionally uh, seen as linguistic. Uh, for me, it started with the thesis of my uh, former student, Bridget Samuels. Um, I think there's lots of people who have followed that tradition. Just a couple of examples here. I, for example, mentioned Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch on uh, the right-hand side of the slide. Um, I've added a bat because I think they didn't just draw the bat, but we've, we are learning a lot from the bats as well. But basically this idea of a faculty of language in the broad sense is an idea that I think we want to preserve to push for this uh, full Darwinian perspective in language. But it's not going to be enough to try to recognize these abilities at a level that, say, linguists might be familiar with. I think it's also very important to pair this description with a neurologically informed and description of behavior. And here, I think the best um, work that I'm uh, familiar with is uh, the perspective by Paul Sizek that really encourages people to not use the sort of cognitive categories that were sort of created for and by humans, um, but rather to, to try to use generic terms that can be readily recognized in other species and understand human behavior in terms of what he calls a phylogenetic refinement. And I think that that's a very um, interesting perspective that he has not applied to language, but I think Um, could be called things that linguists would recognize as, as uh, properly linguistic categories, right? So that's for antecedents. More time, I think, is needed for a Darwinian shift to be successful. And by that, I mean that in order for the language faculty to be seen as a collection of um, traits that have accrued over time, it's necessary to abandon the idea of a very recent evolutionary origin uh, for human language. And fortunately for us, uh, it's now mounting evidence uh, from archaeology especially that um, the history of uh, language and the history of our species really goes far back. I like to make this point by pointing out that um, uh, we now know that the origin of Homo sapiens, the one species that's supposed to be the one that has language, now goes much further back than we thought, was a history that's much more complex with many twists and turns, and cannot be anywhere near like the sudden origin that say linguists like Chomsky still like to entertain. And I think that if we go back to Descartes' intuition and say that being human, that is being sapiens and having language are things that go together, then if we revise the history of what it means to be sapiens, 
we also ought to revise the history of what it means to have language. That is, we should definitely think that our cognitive phylogenies will be as complex and continuous as the history of our own species. And the work of Eleanor Sherry and her colleagues really show how complex and twisted um, the history of our own species uh, was. And there is therefore no reason to assume that this uh, history, evolutionary history of language was, anyway, was in any way simpler than that, right? This is just to say that we'll have to recognize many evolutionary stages that led to the end result that linguists uh, like to study. That's for more time, more sources of evidence. I think here, the big uh, game changer is certainly paleogenetics. Svante Pebo and, and his um, collaborators have given us, uh, I think, a, a new requirement, namely that if you're interested in human cognition, then it's not just gonna be enough to be a linguist, an evolutionary biologist. I think that you have to have um, knowledge of paleogenetics as well. And so this is a source of evidence that will be behind a couple of slides towards the end of the, of the talk, but I think it's a, an important aspect uh, if the full Darwinian view is to um, become dominant uh, in the field. But in this context, I'd like to briefly mention um, a puzzle for me, and that is a puzzle um, that arises when I read um, archaeologists or paleogeneticists talking about this, uh, these new developments that I've just alluded to, these uh, new insights that we can gain about the history of our species. And these observations often uh, point to the need of a dialogue between lots of different disciplines, but there is one discipline that's very rarely mentioned uh, uh, especially in the context of cognition, and that's linguistics. It's very rarely present in, uh, among the fields that are discussed. Historians have a role to play, um, lots of other folks from the humanities, but linguists somehow are not mentioned. And I think that this should make us pause. This should make uh, linguists um, think twice. Um, and I think that part of the reason why linguists haven't been mentioned is because of the dangers that I uh, briefly uh, alluded to at the beginning. Linguistics has isolated itself from other disciplines, evolutionary biology, uh, in fact, other fields of cognition by adopting a very Cartesian view. And as a result, the other fields have largely concluded that we have nothing to contribute. So it's not, um, even though it's disappointing, it shouldn't come to us as a surprise that non-linguists, non-cognitive scientists feel entitled to talk about human cognition without asking us what we think. We've basically become um, irrelevant experts. And I think that this is in part why a full Darwinian view on language um, is necessary to uh, precisely uh, you know, address this gap and be able to enter into a dialogue um, that I think is, is, would be fruitful for all the disciplines, not just for linguists, but also for, for the other disciplines that are interested in language. So in the time that remains, I'd like to um, summarize a few things that have happened in the field of linguistics that are part of this Darwinian view. And it's different from linguistics as many linguists would know it, but I think it's a kind of linguistics that's more open to uh, other disciplines and therefore more useful for my purposes. The first thing that I think um, must happen, must be done by linguists, is considering what are the foundational abstractions that we want to put into a definition of what we mean by language. And here, I think the inspiration should be uh, Hockett's view of the design features of language. I'm not saying that his particular list from now many, many decades ago is the one that we should adopt, 
but something like the idea of a list of design features um, is, I think, particularly helpful. It's particularly helpful because it abstracts away from details from specific languages, not because these are irrelevant, but because this level of abstraction is more appropriate to establish correspondences with other fields, with other species, and so on and so forth. And so I've listed on this slide a few subtraits of language that I think um, should be part of, of a full definition of, of what language is. For example, the fact that uh, it's not just the case that we have an ability to acquire a language when placed in the right environment, uh, we have the ability to acquire many languages. I don't know of any individual that only has the, that has the ability to acquire only one language. And so multilingualism as an ability should be part of the definition of, of what it means to be a linguistic creature. The fact that our communication is largely cooperative is another one. The fact that our words not only have reference, but also sense, the fact that our words are, many of them at least are iconic. The fact that we have tons of idiomaticity, construction grammarians like to emphasize this. The fact that language is multimodal. The fact that language has a rich structure, syntax here. And the fact that it has a certain type of uh, meaning embedded uh, in that structure, compositionality or maybe quantification. These traits um, that can be studied in many different ways in many languages are, I think, the right level to try to uh, seek correspondences and roots for language in other species. And so this type of focus, I think, is, is one exercise that linguists should engage more in uh, to try to add to that. There's another thing that linguists can do to be more relevant for cognitive science. And that is to recognize that in order to understand phylogeny, it's going to be very important to pay attention to, to ontogeny. That is to recognize that language is a thing that's not innate and just emerges out of nowhere, but that it requires a lot of time to develop. And here, the central insight, to me, comes from the work of Jim Herford, uh, who asked uh, already, I think, more than two decades ago for linguists to learn to pair two notions that are equally important and complementary, that is some sort of language acquisition device that must develop that will be familiar to the linguists of a Chomskyan persuasion, but also the fact that um, language is acquired in particular situations of use, and Herford called this the arena of use. And it's these two factors that we must learn to um, integrate with one another to capture the fact that language indeed is indeed a biocultural hybrid. That's not one or the other, you need both perspectives. And here I think the work of Carmelo Smith has a lot uh, uh, to offer, certainly in helping us move away from this modular view of language that I mentioned as one of the dangers uh, of a Cartesian view for, uh, you know, for linguistics to be part of cognitive science. Right? And there's one or two illustrations that I'd like to give to you to show how much progress can be made by, for example, um, exploiting this complement complementarity between some sort of language acquisition device and the arena of use. I think the work of Bill Thompson, Simon Kirby, and Kenny Smith have shown that if you take these two together, that if you recognize the role of culture in shaping the linguistic phenotype just as much as the language acquisition device would, then Automatically, the language acquisition device can be thought of as a series of very generic biases that are much easier to relate to other aspects of cognition or indeed other aspects of uh, neuroscience. Right? So, so this is a PNAS paper. You have the abstract on this slide that shows that 
if you try to um, you know, keep the role of culture and the environment separate from language, then you end up with a language faculty that's very hard to make sense of biologically speaking. But if you recognize the complementarity of those two perspectives, arena of use and language acquisition divide, all of a sudden, the language faculty you end up with is biologically much more realistic, much more evolvable, in fact. Here's a particular example. Of, again, from, from Kirby's work, Kirby and, and, and colleagues, showing that um, if you take into account the role of uh, the need to learn a language and the need to communicate as much as you can when you use language, then you get a certain kind of linguistic phenotype almost for free. What Kirby and colleagues have shown in this work that I'm um, basically pointing at uh, with this slide is that in a particular setting, namely in the setting of an artificial language um, learning experiment, when you ask individuals to uh, try to communicate things to one another and take into account the fact that it's not just that you try to communicate as much as you can, but also that you have memory limitations, all of a sudden the conjunction of these two factors compression for learning and communication give rise to a type of language that they call compositional or systematic, right? That you wouldn't get if you only took one or the other factor into account, right? So just to try to, the attempt to be as expressive as possible or having a language that as easy to learn as possible that wouldn't give you the sort of language that we recognize as a compositional language. It's the need to take both perspectives into account that sort of make a certain uh, linguistic phenotype emerge. And this, I think, is the sort of work that um, is particularly interesting in uh, trying to establish this Darwinian perspective on language. And here is why because it basically asks us to think about language as the product of um, things that evolve in two dimensions. And it's these two dimensions that we should worry about in a cognitive and in, in an evolutionary context. The one dimension that I like to call memorization or learning or language acquisition device, if you want, and the other dimension is, is the arena of use or the, or the desire to share information. And it's about these two things that linguists should uh, ask evolutionary neuroscience questions, right? Not so much the end product, but asking where exactly on these gradients or continuum do we stand? How did we get there, basically? And then um, uh, just briefly, uh, give you an illustration uh, to end. In some of our work, we have tried to show that uh, if you look at uh, our closest extinct relative, the Neanderthal, based on data from paleogenomes, for example, uh, you can identify certain events that seem to impact um, certain regions of the brain more than others. And there are two regions that we have uh, focused on, or two sets of regions. One is a set of regions that make uh, modern humans, compared to their closely uh, related uh, species, more um, friendly or less uh, reactively aggressive. So on the sociability continuum, uh, we occupy a special position uh, thanks to uh, an evolutionary uh, trajectory we have. Also on the sensory motor learning continuum, we occupy a special position largely because circuits involving um, areas like the cerebellum or the striatum have been modified uh, in the course of our evolution. And I think that if we Sit back, sit back a bit and, and ask questions about these changes, it is, I think, easy to see them as ways of modifying the two axes 
that I was mentioning before, the language acquisition device, the memory limitations that impose certain constraints on what can be learned, but also modifying the arena of use, how sociable we are, how much of a cooperative um, species we are, and so how much we are willing to communicate with uh, conspecifics. And I think that uh, if we think of um, the linguistic phenotype as very diverse, we can think of these two axes as essentially two principal components in a principal component analysis that push our linguistic phenotype in specific ways. But the point is that the, the, the focus shouldn't be necessarily on, this, uh, on the end product, on the linguistic end product, but rather the investigation should concentrate on these two axes from which uh, this product emerge. And if you do this, I think that there would be interesting uh, results in um, thinking back of some of the uh, substrates that enter into language. How are these substrates emergent properties when these two axes are modified in the ways that uh, we think? So this is a research program that I'm happy to uh, discuss more with you about. I'd be happy to uh, talk about how different properties could emerge from these two axes. But I think the, the big lessons uh, should be that uh, the Cartesian view had an interesting intuition, namely there is a relationship between having language and being human. But we have learned that being human is actually much more complex than we thought. And for this reason, having language shouldn't be as simple as we used to think as well. So with this, I'll end um, saying that if you're interested, you can read a recent essay of mine to get some uh, more references, but also thank all the people that have helped me um, understand the perspective I've presented uh, much better than I would otherwise have been able to do. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, you might have. Thank you so much, Cedric, for your talk. Um, we're gonna give a five minute break and then we're gonna begin with the Q&A session. Hi okay. everyone. Um, so if anyone has questions, we can proceed with the Q&A session. All right, um, I see Bridget raising her hand. Would you like to ask your question? Sure, thanks. Thanks. Hi, um, hi, hi Cedric, thanks for the talk. Thanks. For um, I, I just have a question about the um, graph that you showed at the end with the sociability and um, and vocal learning basically on the other axis. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's possible to sort of move independently on these axes? Or do you think that there's something that drives this sort of correlated movement? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I think it's actually uh, not only possible to move, uh, you know, independently, uh, so along these axes, but I think it in, in fact happened. Uh, I think that um, the, um, the two axes, of course, mm, you know, impact one another, or influence one another, but I think there is evidence that um, a certain evolutionary trajectory, for example, the one followed by our species along the sociability continuum um, was taking place 
while the sensory motor continuum was not um, evolving, certainly not evolving uh, as fast. Um, maybe later on it, it sort of catches up, but I think that there are periods of our evolution where, um, where things push in different directions. And so what I find um, interesting, although this has not been explored too much, is uh, to think about the end product when these two axes move in, in uh, different directions. That is, what are, what's, if you want, what's the sort of language faculty that you get once you move along one axis, but keep the other one sort of in place, or when you try to move uh, both. Um, and I think that this, offers the possibility that you'll get different end products that could be considered, um, certainly in, in, in our lineage, proto-languages of various kinds, uh, where you know, different uh, realizations of the language faculty. I think that when we talk about the, the modern linguistic phenotype that we have, it requires a certain uh, combination of, of um, of coordinate points on, on both axes. But I think that ex evolution explored um, different options uh, differently over time. So yes, I think it's possible. All right, uh, next we have, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, Nereo. Nereo, how are you? Thanks, yeah. Hi Cedric, it's nice to Hi. see you and wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. And um, I am. Um, I also got a bit inspired with your last thoughts. So um, I understand that this um, relationship between sociability or cooperativity on one side and uh, and uh, sensory motor learning on the other side is very much human, and also the way you presented it, and 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 also in terms of our own evolution. But would you generalize it? to entire phylogeny? And would you say, even beyond mammals, would you say that these were the features, let's say that were involved in cognition in birds, would parrots and crows fit that? You know, I just try to that's, go into the direction and I'm interested what you think about it. It's a great question. Indeed, that's the, that, that's the goal, to try to make people think in this direction precisely for those species as well. So I think that, the, again, just like I, uh, I said to Bridget, the specific um, coordinate points won't be the same for the same species, but I think the axes will be relevant. Um, and uh, we will find that um, birds, um, parrots, uh, corvids uh, will, will move along these axes in, in different ways and, and therefore give rise to systems of communications that are of course distinct from the human language phenotype, but precisely because they move along the same axes, as it were, then can be comparable in some ways, right? Especially when you think that these axes mm, should be grounded in, uh, in a neurobiological substrate, like, like I was alluding with, with, with the drawings that I had of, of different brain parts, right? So we expect, for example, different species to may maybe use the same brain part or innovate among those circuits and therefore, you know, populate the space uh, uh, in, in different ways. And this, I think, could be more useful than saying, ah, look, we only have a system of communication, a communication that's unique to us and therefore the other guys have nothing to tell us. I think that we should uh, think of, um, of these axes as um, valid and relevant for as many species as, as we can study, right? Mm. And so, yes, uh, birds um, of various sorts would certainly be uh, an important uh, part of that story, eventually. Can I, can I ask another question? I mean, I, I, I find this fascinating and I wanted to go that even further. So I, I agree with you. And but there is this one particular group of animals that is always very interesting there, which is octopus. 
that mm -hmm. it doesn't have cortex it doesn't right but it's able to do tasks much more complicated than anything mouse could ever dream of doing eh? mm -hmm. and um um i don't know i was just interested also what what do you think about them are they like really aliens as we consider them sometimes <laughs> or we could fit them you know i i, I it's, it's a good question i think we could fit them also because on the for example on the sensory motor axes that i mentioned um, I was careful not to mention the word cortex, right? Although in our lineage, it certainly, it played an important role, but I think it's not the only factor. So these axes were very underspecified on the slide. Like I said, they should be grounded in, in, in many circuits that support this sensory motor learning or cooperative or sociability, right? And what I think animals like octopus suggest is that, um, these axes really have uh, a lot of richness to them uh, for uh, you know different species to populate very different parts of the axis. I think what I want to uh, to try to do, so this is my homework, is is to stick to the validity of of the axes for as many species as possible. But the values will end up being very different, and therefore the resulting behavior will end up being very different. Right. Um, the inspiration for the principal component, uh, you know, bit at the end was if you think, for example, of, of craniofacial development, that's something that varies a lot across different species to the point where you'd think I'm not going to compare, uh, you know, uh, a primate craniofacial phenotype with something else. But nonetheless, people have found deep homology across very distant uh, species, right? And this, in a certain sense, is, is a task that we should also apply to cognition as well. And in the case of language, I think these two axes um, have been shown to be useful. And so now, now the task is actually to, to populate uh, that with, with a lot more species like you are uh, asking with, with, those, with those good points, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much for your questions. And do we have any other questions? Uh, you can raise your hand or you can type it in the chat. We have a question from, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name again, Ri? Yes, I'm Ri. Uh, thank Hi, you, Ria. Frederick. Hi. Um, so I have um, two questions. And um, one is uh, about the design feature and the a continuum uh, perspective or you uh, at the end or the, wow. this um, yeah graduality um, view so how can so on one hand with design features i have um, many categories of language some, somehow and i'm, I'm just asking uh, how to map those kind of design features onto the continuum or the grad you know gradual aspect with you uh, discussed at the end, are they point on this gradient or are they connections between gradient or how can I imagine? Uh -huh. okay. connection? Good, yeah. uh, good question um, or good set of questions. So the the design features um, are there to, to sort of um, try to break down uh, the language phenotype into things uh, that are a little bit more manageable. Right? Um, and uh, in some cases, at least those that I listed, and this is not a list that's you know set in stone, but it's mm, I think not too difficult to um, to try to uh, locate them on the little um, you know drawing that I had at the end. So for example, if you think of our pragmatic system as an instance of cooperative communication, that's clearly along the arena of use gradient or sociability continuum. Right? If you think of the sort of structure that we impose on, on the signal, syntax roughly, uh, then it would be along the other gradient, the sensory motor gradient. By contrast, if you think of uh, compositionality or semantics, I think that's more likely, as Kirby and others show, to be the 
an emergent feature of a specific conjunction of values on these two gradients. So I, th I don't think that there is a unique answer to your question when it comes to these abilities. What I would like to do is for, or, or what I would encourage people to do as well is to, for, for each of these substrates, to try to place them somewhere that is either as a specific combination of values or as unique values on one or the other axes. Yeah, um, but I don't think that uh, there is an answer that says it's always on this axis or that axis. Sometimes it's an emergent property. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, another question is uh, yeah, maybe a bit of um, formulation question or vocabulary question. Mm. Um, so, um, because your talk points out the continu continuity between uh, the animals and humans uh, very much, mm -hmm. um, but if we um, think about specific combination of um, yeah same set of capacities, again we have to talk about some kind of specificity in humans because uh, yeah somehow. So um, I was just wondering whether we can also see a uh, yeah, specific um, kind of combination of different ability, for example, as continuum, um, or whether it's um, again a kind of specificity which is um, yeah, associated to humans. So how, how, so it's just a question how you would uh, yeah, express this uh, issue. So I think, uh, thanks for the question. I, I think the, the idea of continuum, thinking back of the last slide that I showed with the drawing, is the, I, I think it should be the, the focus of investigation. So whether it's you, people agree with me on, on the particular axes or something that's uh, separate, but as long as we see them as gradients or continuums or something, that's really where people should actually put a lot of effort in, in figuring out what's going on there. Mm, the specificity, of course, is not totally lost because, for example, it's not just about language. It is the case that we are different from other species. So, um, you know, there is a, a notion of specificity to be recovered there. But that should be the end product of Oh, uh, that would be, if you want, specific values of the combination of, of the various continua that I, that, that I was mentioning. And I think that um, the, if, if you want, the, the, the traditional focus has been on the specific values on these continua that do indeed make a lot of differences. Right. So it's, it is indeed the case that the space is populated, like different regions of the space is populated differently by different species. Whereas I think we should ask, what are the, uh, the, the values on the continuum? Because that, that enables us to, to relate to other species or other systems uh, much more easily rather than the end point. Right? So that was sort of the message at the end of, yes, there will be specific values that give you the specificity, right? But that shouldn't be the, the focus of investigation because there I don't see, I, I don't see what's next, in other words, uh, in terms of research questions. But if we try to understand the axes better, then I think uh, there's a lot more work uh, to be done. Like Nereo was asking, you know, about placing different species along, uh, along. Uh, along these lines. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Thank you for your question, Ria. Um, so do we have any other questions? I think I'm taking a look at the participants if they have raised any hands. Maria still has her hand raised. All right. Um, I would assume those were all the 
questions that we have for today. So thank you. Uh, thanks thank you so much everyone uh, who attended and uh, best of luck with the initiative. Thank you very much for your talk and uh, we, we truly appreciate your support to our community. Thanks a lot. All right, have Bye. a wonderful day. Bye-bye.